Well, welcome everybody. Um, for many of the students that I have not met, I am Ms. Mulligan and I um, am the Alumni Relations Director here at Cary Academy, which is one of the reasons that I'm not a familiar face uh, because really our interaction won't begin until after graduation. And so we are thrilled that you are with us today. Welcome to our alum. We wish we could have you here on campus, uh, but we're really looking forward to this session, um, Careers in Law and Advocacy. So we are going to have Will, um, Caps, who's a sophomore here at CA, introduce our alumni. And when Ms. Sellers and I um, started chatting about these flex day options, we put together a small group of students and Will was one of them to kind of help us decide what we wanted these to look like, who we were gonna invite to come and speak. And so um, that's how Will kind of got tapped to be involved. Um, and just for our alum to know and all of our students, we really want the goal of these sessions um, to communicate to you and for you to hear from alumni who used to be students here at CA, you don't have to have it all figured out. They're all very successful alumni, um, but their career journeys have taken lots of turns. Um, and so they are gonna share a little bit how they ended up where they are today and um, what they had took from their time at CA to where they are now. So Will, I'm gonna turn it over to you to introduce our alumni. All right, uh, hey everyone, thanks again for being here. Um, we have four alumni to talk today. Um, each one's gonna give a short presentation, probably five or six minutes on their careers and some of the things that they're doing. Um, and then we'll give you guys an opportunity to ask questions that you might have. Um, so I'll talk about their bios in a second, but if you have um, any questions that you think of while they're talking, um, you can put those in the chat um, and you can also ask them at the end and we'll go over each one. Um, so again, we have four alumni. Um, the first one is Sam Fuchs. Um, he graduated from CA in 2007, and now he's a program associate at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation in Princeton, New Jersey, um, and he's been there for close to three years now. Um, Brianna Gaddy graduated um, in 2012, and since she graduated law school last August, uh, she's been a law clerk to Judge Jeannie Hong in Maryland. Um, Meredith Glaubach graduated Cary Academy in 2013. And for the past three years, uh, she's been a network de um, development coordinator at the Community Food Bank of Southern Arizona. And then finally, uh, Haley Morgus graduated from Cary Academy in 2012. And for the past two and a half years or so, uh, she's been working at the Treasury Department as a sanctions compliance officer. Um, so those are the four alumni. Uh, first up is Sam. Um, and he's, again, a program associate at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And I'll hand it off to him. Great. Thanks, Will. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, a real treat to spend some time with you today. Um, I think I'm definitely on the earlier side of the alums gathered here, but um, I will tell you that it doesn't really feel like it's been that long. And every time I go back to campus to visit, um, some things feel different, but a lot of it, it just still feels like home. So, um, uh, Will, thank you for the great introduction. Um, so I'll delighted to chat with you a bit just about where what I do now, how I got here, um, and uh, what it's like to have a path that's sort of somewhat figured out, but still kind of uh, emergent <laughs> as you go. So um, if you, so uh, the photo there on the cover, that was uh, from two years ago, by the way, uh, when I went to the Aspen Ideas Festival in Aspen, Colorado, uh, which was an amazing experience and one of the many nice things I got to do as part of my job, which is why I included it there. Um, Carrick, can you advance to the next slide, please? So um, it's hard to summarize the last, you know, 10, 13, you know, plus years, but in a nutshell, uh, here are just three highlights. Um, that's me and two of my great, good friends, Alex Rosen, and Brendan Q from high school. Um, I've lost touch with Brendan, but I'm still in good contact, close touch with Alex. Um, graduated Cary Academy, went to college at Brandeis outside of Boston. Um, at one point in internship, had the honor of interning in the Obama administration and the Office of Presidential Correspondence, uh, working where they handled mail, proclamations, and all sorts of um, fun materials. Um, and then on the right was uh, another photo from the Aspen Ideas Festival, where I got to attend um, on behalf of the foundation, uh, as we were one of the sponsors of the conference, and uh, got to hear lectures from and from. Uh, everyone from foreign government officials to some celebrities um, and in between. I think, um, I guess the only way to sort of summarize the experience of the Aspen Ideas Festival is that when you're waiting to speak with, to say, ask a question to one of the presenters afterwards, you have to wait in line because 
the former chair of the National Economic Council at the White House is trying to network in front of you. <laughs> so um, anyway, um, but I'll, I think that'll sort of be a nice segue into my job, my role now. Um, so I'll just leave this here and um, I'll sort of touch on these various points as I go through. But the main thing I want to leave you with is the one that um, Ms. Mulligan mentioned that you uh, you may not have, you likely may not have a specific path figured out right now, and that's completely fine. Um, I actually remember talking with Ms. Sellers, I think it was actually, it was back when I was in high school about how, unless you were in maybe law or med school, um, mostly med school where you sort of have a path figured out because you know that there's certain act specific steps that you have to do you don't really have a specific path um and that's okay it's actually kind of exciting um so uh i'll start with my current job and then work backwards so i work at the robert wood johnson foundation which is the nation's largest health philanthropy um, we give out grants to universities nonprofits, community organizations researchers advocacy organizations um, and many, many different other types of groups uh, and individuals um, on the tune of 550, actually this year, 600 million per year. Um, so, it, which um, as it's, as I mentioned, it's the largest philanthropy in the country that's solely dedicated to health. Um, so philanthropy is itself a, a whole field uh, one that I only learned about in the last few years, but if you think ever hear stories about the Gates Foundation or the Ford Foundation, um, a lot of what philanthropy does is sort of built creating fields and funding organizations and individuals to do sort of research that looks really far ahead, as well as work that is in the moment. Um, it's this really interesting intersection point between the public sector and the private sector and the nonprofit world, um, and as well as academia. Um, so um, I work, I came to the foundation because of my background and my work in health and social policy. Uh, the way I got to health policy was because from starting Cary, from Cary Academy onwards, I was really fascinated by federal government. Um, took a course on healthcare in undergrad, um, learn, uh, learned that a lot of things that my mother, family, doctor had told me about, um, especially the challenges she'd faced were not just ones that she faced alone, but were actually shared throughout the entire field. Um, that led me to a social science research job after college um, in Washington, D.C., which in turn then led me to another job that was sort of more on the working directly with the state governments on health insurance exchanges. Um, got to learn what call centers are like. That's a whole other experience. Um, did that, um, that in turn led me to grad school in public policy uh, and now um, to working in philanthropy. So really quick high level overview, um, but I'm, I'm intentionally just giving you the overview so that to, cause I'm trying to fit in a lot into a short period of time. So um, a typical day for me, um, is uh yeah typical day is anything from brainstorming sessions with my colleagues to figure out sort of what type of grants we want to award which ones are coming up to review which ones might um continue or shift um having calls with the grantee organizations to talk about their progress and what they're working on provide feedback um sometimes we have a lot of informational calls with um other organizations um and uh, and then also just sort of tracking the latest in health policy developments. Um, connections to see, uh, let's see, I, I have, I'm getting close to time. So Kara, can you go to the next slide? <laughs> I'm going to jump ahead to just some parting words and hopefully I can cover the other stuff in Q and A. Um, but what I kind of want to leave you with are a lot of things. Um, embrace a little uncertainty. Uh, don't compare yourself to others too much know or at least try to identify when sort of how to play the game and follow the rules and also when it makes sense to set the rules aside um, especially when it comes to looking for internships or jobs um, and also finally just remember that success is not a destination uh, th those were parting words from my advisor at, at Cary Academy um, and is a phrase I've tried to keep in mind throughout my academic and professional career ever since um, I think I have a lot more I'd like 
to say, but I think I'll just sort of save it for the Q&A section. So I'll just wrap it up. Thanks. <laughs> Before we go um, to our next presenter, it was also good for all you all to know that Sam serves on our alumni board. And so yes. he mm -hmm. is a part of the board um, and really speaks into a lot of the things that the alumni um, association does. And so another great opportunity for you to get involved once you graduate. Hello, everyone. My name is Brianna. I, as Will so eloquently said, I graduated from Cary Academy in 2012, and I was a student there from sixth grade all the way to 12th grade. So I really feel like I understand where you all are. I know times have changed, but I remember being in those same seats at Cary Academy. Um, so now I'm a lawyer. I'm working for a judge in Baltimore. I went to law school in Washington, D.C., and then after that, I ended up here for a one-year clerkship opportunity. But when I was thinking about what I wanted to do in 12th grade, I never really would have imagined that I'd be sitting here as a lawyer today. So don't think that whatever ideas you have now in 9th through 12th grade is where you'll end up because the world will surprise you a lot. So I'm going to go kind of on the timeline as to how I got to where I am today. It's going to be kind of quick because I don't want to run out of time. But after I graduated from Cary Academy, I went to UNC Chapel Hill and I double majored in global studies and Spanish with a minor in social and economic justice. And one of the most transformative experiences that I had while I was in college was studying abroad for a semester in Spain. And that really just opened my eyes wide open to the opportunities. Although at Cary Academy, I went to Chile for two weeks, staying somewhere, living with the host family for multiple months really impacted me. And I knew that was a place I wanted to get back to eventually. So after I graduated from college, I applied on a whim to teach English in Spain. And I got placed in this tiny, tiny city in Spain on the Eastern side of Spain. I, and so it was like a very mountainous area. I took the bus into the town where I was teaching every day. And that was a wonderful experience. I taught students from six years old all the way up to 15. So it was a very interesting experience because I just graduated college and did not think that I could be teaching students, but somehow it happened. <laughs> um, but while I was there, I realized I really enjoyed kids and advocating for children. But my day to day in teaching, I felt like I wasn't creating the effect that I wanted to have on a macro level. So while I was there, I decided to apply to law school, which is a big jump because I thought that I was going to move back to the States and become a teacher, but that's not what happened. So I went to American University for law school and that's three years. And in that at American, I did a lot of different internships. So even while I was in law school, I wasn't exactly sure what type of law I wanted to go into. And the way I kind of figured out what type of law I wanted to go into was through internships. So I highly recommend doing as many of those and opening up to so many different opportunities that you can have. So one of the internships that I did was at the EEOC, which is the Equal Employment e e uh, Opportunities Commission. <laughs> and in that, I would get different, so back up. So the EEOC prosecutes crimes for people who think they've been discriminated against in their workplace. And so in my role as a law clerk for the EEOC, they would give me a file and based on the standards that the EEOC uses, I have to determine if there is a case that the EEOC wants to prosecute or if that individual will take that claim and go to court themselves. And that was a really interesting experience and it's kind of hard for me because I didn't think that I was in the position to make those calls. But I think something that I learned at Cary Academy and something that continued on through my time is just being able to trust that you are in this role and you are given this opportunity because you can do that. I think imposter syndrome is something that we all face when we're going into areas that we haven't experienced before. But I think Cary Academy taught me to lean into discomfort and lean into those really hard, difficult things. And you might surprise yourself. And I can say that I had surprised myself in that job. And from that, I really learned that I liked employment work. And so that's the type of law that I want to practice after my clerkship. So channeling now to what I'm doing, I am a law clerk for a judge in a circuit court. And my judge, Judge Hong, she's a general trial judge. So she does both civil and criminal work. So I would say I get into work around eight or so, and we have all these files that we have to determine what we're gonna do with. And most of them are set in for a hearing. So it's preparing for the hearing, 
doing case summaries, looking up the legal case law that is necessary for the case, and then you go into the hearing and see what happens. And I think what I love about it is I never know what's going to happen in my day. I can prepare as much as I think, and then when I get into the hearing, something completely different happens. So it's being able to just be able to think on your feet and just be open to whatever happens. I would say that um, something I really like about this job is because it's both civil and criminal, I'm still learning new areas of the law all the time and I get to do new research. It's not monotonous at all. I surprise myself every day by trying to figure out what's going on. Um, and after I am done with this clerkship, it's just a one year long clerkship, I will be going to a law firm and doing labor and employment work in DC. And in that role, I'm not exactly sure what it'll be. It'll be a new experience for me, but I know that I'll be working on those like harassment cases and similar things that I did at the EEOC and trying to help um, with those types of cases. Um, let me go to what I should talk about. Oh, okay. Something that I learned from Cary Academy. So I would think that really leaning into your professors and your teachers, they care about you so much and they believe in you. So just asking all the questions and don't be afraid to ask questions. I ask questions every single day in my job. And I think being confident in that. And I think being confident in new experiences and being okay if your path isn't exactly what you pictured um, that it would be and going along with those like side routes that you might have to take and seeing what you can learn from them. And please, after this, feel free to like add me on LinkedIn if you'd like to chat or you can send me an email. I'll like write it in the chat below. Um, but thank you all. I'm excited for your questions. Thank you so much, Brianna. We are now going to move to Meredith. It's it's good morning over in Arizona. So um, I am Meredith, um, and I currently work for a nonprofit in Arizona um, that has different programs that address um, food injustices. So again, I as many others have done, I'll start from the very beginning, but. I wanted to do a lot of different things. So in high school, I was really interested in feminism. Like that was my main interest. Um, and I tried to incorporate that into like a lot of my like school projects. Um, I really loved my environmental science class, Miss Malloy's science class. Um, and I was like interested in like math and science and interested in like art. Um, so First, I wanted to be a civil engineer because that's kind of environment and STEM. Um, and I liked the idea of being a woman in a male dominated field. That quickly changed and I decided I wanted to be an architect, um, but I went and looked at all of these like architecture schools and people were studying until like three or four every day. And I was like, that's not for me. Um, and so I took AP Psych and was like, all right, I'm just gonna go in to college doing psychology. Um, and so I went to Rice University in Texas, spent a whole year and a half doing psychology. And I was like, no, I really don't wanna do this. Um, and so I like thought back to like, okay, what do I like really care about? Um, and so I majored in women's studies and minored in environmental studies. Um, and found that the intersection of the two that I was really interested in was food justice. Um, and so um, I also did a lot of internships and found that was a really helpful way to think through like what I was interested in um, and also just see like the variety of jobs that uh, you can do about like any, any issue that you're interested in. Um, so, I um, really wanted to work in a nonprofit related to food justice um, and graduated college, definitely heard from like some folks that like, what are you gonna do with that degree? Like you're not gonna be able to get a job, you're not gonna be able to like live on that wage. Um, and, and it was like tricky to get a job initially out of college, but like it can be done um, and so I did a year at AmeriCorps, which um, is similar to Peace Corps, if anyone's heard of that. It's basically 
um, a year placement at a nonprofit somewhere in the US. Um, and it's somewhere between like an internship and a staff program or a staff position. So you're not paid very much, but you get to do work that you might otherwise not be able to do. Um, and so I wanted to take a position um, at the, the food bank that I currently work at because um, it both does work that's really like charity. So we, we give out food boxes to people. We um, deal with the, the short term um, problems of like people needing immediate hunger. And like, that's what a lot of nonprofits do. And then it also deals with more like long-term systems change, the justice work. Um, so we have garden education, political and civic education, job training, um, and we're getting into community organizing. So like changing some of the, like the systems and structures. Um, so I was really excited to be in a nonprofit that does both. Um, so after my AmeriCorps year um, of doing like data analysis or like um, data entry that I really was not interested in, I ended up getting hired full time at the food bank. Um, and so now I work as our like partner network builder. Um, and so I get to do a lot of really different things. Um, I um, work with a lot of our partners who are giving out like food boxes. And so I do a lot of like data um, collection and analysis about them. So um, in a little ways, like getting back to like the, the math and science that I liked, getting to do some like stats and um, uh, lots of like graphs and Excel skills. Um, and then on a very small scale, I um, do what Sam does. And so we give out some, some small grants um, to other organizations. So I get to manage like a process like that. And then we're also doing some collective action work with um, grassroots organizations. So basically thinking of like, what is our common goal and how do we, how do we work to make very like localized uh, policy changes? So I get to do like a really large variety of things, um, which is really challenging sometimes and also very exciting. Um, so uh, each day looks really different. The, the common across all of it is that there are lots of meetings. It's a lot of collaborative work and it's very like people focused. Um, and, and I really love that about my job. Um, and I really like that, that I really like believe in what I do um, and excited to take questions when we get to that part. All right. Hi, everyone. My name's Haley Morgus. Um, feel free to shoot me a message on LinkedIn or I put my email address here. Um, I work in DC. I work at the US Department of the Treasury, specifically in the Office of Foreign Assets Control, which is a fancy phrase for sanctions. Um, as you may or may not know, starting in the Obama administration, sanctions have become a really hot topic for how to resolve a whole lot of foreign policy issues. Um, and so I have the fun job of being involved in that. Specifically, I work in our compliance division. And so we focus on the regulated community, which is the financial sector, banks, et cetera. I um, have never taken finance in my life, so it's a lot of fun um, on a day-to-day -day basis to deal with banks and virtual currency and insurance and all that stuff. So, you know, school can take you anywhere. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis, I do casework where we look into apparent violations of sanctions by banks. Um, I help with policy discussions and how those policies that the NSC and others are developing will impact the financial community. And then I do outreach to the financial community and others about sanctions and answer all of their questions. So it's a fun job, especially because, you know, these people at banks and lawyers have so much more experience than me, but I get to deal with their questions on a day to day anyways. And um, it's a whole lot of fun. But as you can probably see, this was a wandering path for how I got here. Um, I had no idea what I wanted to do in high school. I really liked a push with Mr. Hall. I really liked reading books and all of my English classes, but like can you read books for a living? I wasn't quite sure. Um, 
RJ let us watch the West Wing in our Gov classes during double block. And I wanted to be CJ Craig, who's the press secretary to the president. But that's a really hard job to get to. So I was really lost. Um, so I did 600 seconds, which I don't know if that exists anymore, but we used to be in a closet um, in the sophomore hallway and do the news every morning. And so I went to Miss Sellers in my junior year and I was like, I wanna go somewhere where one, I can play tennis, get a scholarship. And then two, that has a communications program and a Chinese program, because I really liked my study abroad trip. Um, Miss Sellers found a school I'd never heard of in my life, a small liberal arts school called Loyola in Baltimore. And I loved it. It was really great to go to a small school because all of these professors were so invested in everything that you did. Um, and so I went in as a communications major, but I was also in the honors program. And one of my honors teachers was like, you know, you seem like you're really into this whole classics history whatnot. And I was like, yeah, but my parents told me I need a job if I get one of those majors. And he's like, yeah, but you should try taking other classes. Don't just take communications classes. And I took a political science class that I absolutely fell in love with. Um, and that professor encouraged that I do a double major in political science. And that's what really got me going. Um, the perk of being in Baltimore is if you try hard enough, you can get to DC for an internship every day. It takes you two hours, but you get there. Um, and so I interned at the State Department in 2015 when John Kerry was Secretary of State and helped with some of the um, foreign press engagement with members of the State Department working on the climate change negotiations back then under COP21. And if I'd fallen in love with the fictional West Wing government, John Kerry's State Department made me fall in love with the real life federal government. So I was hooked. Um, but getting a job in the government is hard. There's this cryptic website called USA Jobs, which I have on here, which first a computer screens your resume and you hope for the best, right? And so after, well, my senior year, I started looking for jobs and everything was pretty um, data entry or didn't pay enough that I could even rent an apartment in DC. And so I was like, man, how can I get paid more money but still work for the government? And the answer was grad school, go spend money so you can make more money. Um, and so I went to Johns Hopkins, but I decided to go to Johns Hopkins in China because I'd kept studying Chinese after Cary Academy. Um, Li Laoshir who used to be the Chinese teacher was so proud of me for going to China for two years. My classes were in Chinese, but the main goal was get that master's degree, get paid more money. Um, I had a lot of fun over in China, learned a lot, just studied regular international affairs with a huge Asia twist. Came back um, and luckily had this thing called a Boren Scholarship, which I've put on here the link to. You can get it in grad school or in undergrad for studying a critical language abroad. And they gave me money towards school. And what I had to do was find a job in the government to sort of pay them back, which perfect, exactly what I wanted to do. Finding that is tricky. There are various forums where they're trying to help you find jobs, but I actually found my job on Facebook. Someone posted, hey, we're hiring at OFAC. Um, we're hiring Borens, send in your resume. Um, jobs can come from anywhere. And so now here I am working this job and something that took me a long time to learn. I've been doing this for two and a half years and finally I feel like I'm on the right footing. But I think looking back at, you know, I was into the critical thinking classes, right? Like, Math and science were not my thing. They're awesome. I'm really impressed by people that can do it, but I liked reading and analyzing and that's what I do on a day to day. Um, so I really encourage, you know, just letting your path take you where it goes. But I talk to a lot of my professors all the time. I life crisis to their face being like, I have no idea what I wanna do. Should I get a business degree? Cause that's how you make money, um, all that kind of stuff. So, and going abroad, I think definitely changed. Similar to Brianna changed my life. Um, I put a link here. I think Ms. Sellers knows of this program because my younger sister Sullivan did it. Um, there's this study abroad state department program for high school students and just looking into that kind of stuff early and knowing what your options are for fellowships and just trying to learn about what's possible, I think is really important. If I hadn't gotten the bore in in grad school, I don't think I would have the job I have today. Um, so just constantly looking for new opportunities and Googling stuff like <laughs> is really important. Um, but I think the biggest thing I think as Sam mentioned too is just talk to a lot of people and get their ideas and thoughts on, on what you could do because I think growing up there are so many things my parents are both accountants I thought you had to do something very I don't know standard and there's so many jobs out there that you don't even know exist until you start asking people questions so I do love that this exists because none of us I think have your typical 
job that everyone always talks about. So um, feel free to ask us all kinds of questions and, and thanks for having me. Thank you all very much. Um, if you, students, if you have any questions, please feel free to either put them in the chat or if you um, want to turn your cameras on and, at, and unmute and ask the questions, that is completely appropriate and welcomed as well. So, sorry, hi. Um, can I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> this is for Ms. Morgus. I was wondering. Do you think the fact that it was Chinese especially kind of benefits in your particular career or do you think just having that foreign language experience in general is something that's helped you? Like, do you think um, studying a language in college from a country that's more politically connected to the United States could potentially further your career more in kind of state related jobs? That's a good question. So I think looking at what the US government defines as critical languages is probably helpful. I think that'll probably be on the State Department page, but there's also something called the Critical Language Scholarship. The government likes to give money for Americans to study those. And I think a lot of people, you know, they go to African countries, they go to the Arab speaking world, like they go to Asia. Um, so I think Chinese definitely helped me. I don't use it in my job. I would like to eventually, and I do do some China, Hong Kong related stuff. Um, but I, I think, especially in DC, we like to say everyone has interned at a department, everyone has a master's degree and everyone speaks a foreign language. That's just like the basic of your resume and that stinks, but it's a, it's a lot of smart people here. So I think anything that can help you stand out um, is really helpful. Obviously a language that you love, a place you wanna go, but I think Chinese has helped me um, stand out a bit. Okay, thank you. Well, um, sorry, I, I'll take this one in the chat and put, put it out there. A um, question that came in, do you know of any internships for high schoolers or other opportunities related to your areas of work? Or any suggestions, I guess, for how to get started in that in high school, which is a really good question. So I did a few internships in high school. It was less, I, I as I mentioned, I graduated in 2007. So like, I, I don't know what high school is like now. I mean, I know a little bit, but um, it was less common, but it, I, there were, I remember just reaching out to or contacting various family friends, who I knew had jobs in fields that were like kind of interesting to me. I didn't necessarily always know like what their jobs were, like really were, um, and sort of finding out how, if there were, you know, if they had some opportunities. Um, one example I was interested in, as I mentioned, you know, sort of pu public policy, there was, I knew that there was a center that I had read about a center being started at the UNC Law School to study poverty. I sent them, you know, a cold call email saying, you know, I'm a local high school student. I'd, are there any opportunities? You know, I'm around in the summer. And they said, sure, come in. And I got to meet with people and, you know, did just some basic research on land loss cases and poverty statistics and got to join a few meetings with some law students in the summer and hear about their research projects. Like it's amazing, especially when you're in high school and you're, you don't necessarily need to be paid. Um, you should definitely ask to be compensated for work in general, like in principle, but if you're some, if it's something where you're interested in just doing something a few days a week in the summer where you know you're going to be around and um, it's local, like people are really interested in helping you out and they're always grateful for any assistance usually. So um, I definitely encourage you to just sort of basically just sort of ask around and even if it's something you're not solely, even if you don't know the full details, just it's good to probe. <laughs> I would also add that and people make the joke that lawyers love to hear themselves talk. So even if you just like email someone or ask around if any lawyers and you can just say, hi, could I meet with you just to kind of hear about what you do? And it's a really great way to just understand 
what someone does, how they got there. And you'll realize that their path is not linear and just say, oh, I didn't even realize I could do that to end up at this point. And I wish I had done more of that a lot earlier on. I did that a lot more in college and when I was in law school, but starting early, even trying to decide what colleges you wanna to go to, just going and speaking to people and asking about their specific experiences, I highly recommend. Um, I sent on my PowerPoint a link for youth programs from the State Department, which my sister did when she was in high school. And so all, any of those sort of fellowship scholarship things are for high schoolers. So if Kara and Ms. Sellers want to send that around or put that in the chat. Um, I wish I had done that. And so when my younger sister did, I was like, you're one step ahead of me. Um, one thing that my dad made me do when I was in high school was reach out to random people to ask about their jobs, especially when I didn't know what to do. I hated it because talking to adults is terrifying. Um, but you get something out of it and adults are really nice and sometimes they buy you coffee. So whether you can network through your parents or through your friend's parents or Miss Sellers or something, I think talking to as many people as possible. And then I would just recommend volunteering. I think I didn't know until college or, or later what things I cared about because I spent a lot of high school studying and playing tennis. Um, and so I wish I had maybe gotten out in the community more to figure out what's possible out there. Yeah, I feel like I would, the second what Haley said is like understanding yourself I feel like is way more important than like getting a head up about like getting to your career in high school like I I think that kind of pressure can be really like detrimental and like I I wouldn't say it it's the most important thing um it, it was definitely a privilege but I got to go to basically like a summer camp that was like a pre-college um thing and I got to like take some classes in high school that would have been more like college um fun classes and so that really helps me think of like what do I want to study what um what am I interested in what might I want to do I don't know if NSLC still exists but I did that pro in like 10th grade or something and I went to a journalism one and that's when I was like phew I finally know what I want to major in also a privilege because it costs money and everything, but that was definitely an opportunity that helped me gain experience. Great. Those are all really good tips. And we've got a couple more questions that have come in that are great. Um, the next one is, what are essential skills you need to work in these law and advocacy related professions? And what are ways you can start practicing them in high school? I'll, I'll jump in quickly. I mean, I think it's not I'll, I mean, I think this is, good. I hope this doesn't sound like I'm just trying to give a vague answer, but just anything you can do to think about your critical thinking skill to skills and just problem solving and looking at complex situations from a number of different perspectives and sort of thinking about like um, sort of what Meredith was saying about how, for example, you know, food and her work, it's sort of both looking at immediate needs, but also sort of structural needs beyond like anything you can do to sort of look at problems and both sort of immediate and then sort of underlying causes. Um, I, I like to think these are just general good life skills for any career, and I, I actually do believe that. Um, but I mean, those are the that's sort of the type of thinking that I use in my job, you know, every day, and every job I've had actually. Anyone else want to chime in on that one? I would say writing and communication skills, like totally critical thinking. And then like, how do you talk about those ideas um, or write about those ideas so that other people could understand? Great. The next one is uh, when you were looking, all looking at colleges, what were, I'm sorry, we'll start over. When you were all looking at colleges, what were the specific features that you personally looked for? And did you, in, and did that end up helping you after graduating? I can start with that one. So I knew coming from Cary Academy, I wanted to go to a really big school and I wanted that environment of like sports and that like typical college environment. So I applied to a lot of bigger schools. I also applied to like Wake Forest and Elon because those are close to home. Um, and I ended up going to Chapel Hill, but I also knew that Chapel Hill had a really good study abroad program because I knew that was something that I wanted to do when I was at in college. Um, and I also, 
believed I really liked Spanish when I was in high school. So I wanted to see an opportunity where they had really good Spanish programs. And I remember like speaking with people that went to UNC. One thing that Carrie Academy is known for is sending a lot of students to UNC. So there was uh, many people I could reach out to and ask about that. And so I found that most beneficial. I was definitely scared of the UNCs because Carrie Academy was so small that I, I wanted somewhere small that I could feel more confident walking up to my professors. I also wanted to use athletics to fund school. So Ms. Sellers had the fun job of finding me a D1 school that had all the academic rigor that I wanted. Um, and she found the perfect fit. I think um, going to a small school helped me because I felt like I got really close to my professors, especially there were only five political science ones. And so I took their classes over and over again. And so I still talk to them often now and they were really helpful in my career path. Um, and I think going to a liberal arts school was also important for me because while I knew I had to major in something, I really wanted to, like Sam had said, critical thinking was really big. So I took, you know, theology and philosophy and gender studies and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so I wanted the diverse background that just helps you go on to whatever's next. I, I went to a school that like, was not super political, but like I found my niche. I feel like you're, you're always gonna find your niche. You're always gonna find your professors. Like my school was like really focused on like med students and STEM students. And I wasn't either of those. And like, I still found amazing professors. Um, I like to brag that one of my professors is on the Wikipedia page for feminism. Um, um, so um, I feel like uh they're like good choices to make but also like you'll you'll be able to like find what you need at almost any school i'll just add it's you know it's about the environment that you think you're going to like and you and i know it's sort of hard to know exactly because you are going to change you are going to mature you're going to have different you know you will change your major you'll have different feelings but you know, at least as a starting point, I was looking for a medium, a small-ish, medium-sized school that had good to study politics and theater. Uh, I went to Brandeis, um, ended up studying history and theater and a little bit of politics, but that was, you know, but I still sort of studied a lot of the, it's had the types of classes that I thought I would study. They just had different labels. Um, so, uh, and it was an amazing fit for me. So it's, it, it's sort of, it's the size, I think size, the environment, um, and so sort of the, gen the general atmosphere you're looking for. That's great advice. I love how you guys are doing my job for me too. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, and this is a question to you, Brianna, um, somebody who had read another Brianna, uh, who had read the article in the CA Magazine about you, which is really neat to see that students are reading that <laughs> magazine, which is awesome. And wondering if you could hear, you could hear, you could talk a little bit more about your work with EEOC and what you'll be working on in the future. Of course. Hi, Brianna. Nice to meet you. Um, this is a wonderful question. So the EOC is a federal agency, and I worked in a certain division at the headquarters, which is in Washington, D.C. And part of what the EOC does is it determines like some people will submit things like, hey, this happened to me while I was at work or I was not promoted in my job because I'm a woman or because I'm black or a lot of different things. And they go and say, hey, I want to get some relief from this. And part of what I would do is I would take that case and I would investigate with other people and see that does the law, will the law give them some relief? And if so, will um, the EEOC be the ones that prosecute it? And so if the EEOC decides that they want to prosecute this case, then they will take that person's case and go along with it. But at times, because the EEOC is so very overwhelmed, we just can't take every case that comes up. So they will say, no, we're not gonna do it at this time, but you are free to pursue your case. So I would look up a lot of case law, like what is harassment under the law? What standards have to be met for something to rise to the level of harassment or to rise to the level of discrimination? And I would write memos to my supervisors and let them know like this happened, this is the facts of the case, this is what the law says. And then I applied 
the law to the facts of the case and came up with a recommendation. And based on that recommendation, they would determine if that is something that they want to go further and continue looking into or no sending it to a private attorney to take care of. And so working in that field now, I'm working as a law clerk. So I kind of get a mix of things. But once I'm done with my clerkship year, I'm going to be working for a law firm. And in that, clients will come to us, um, employers and employees, and say, hey, this is a problem. Like, let me think of an example. Like, if an employer comes and they want to fire X amount of people, there are certain laws that have to be met before you can fire X amount of people. So they're like, what do we need to do to make this available to us? And I do the similar thing. I look at the law. I look at the facts of the case that is before us. And I create a recommendation. And I would give that to my supervisor. And we make discussions. And at times, we would have to go to trial, like if someone's stating that like their building, for example, was not up to code in which that they were able to use the facilities, we would go to court and advocate on their behalf and our relief would be them fixing the building or something of that sort. Great, that's great. Thank you so much, Brianna. And I see that uh, in terms of the time, we are right at the end. And I think just to wrap up, if I could, well, first of course, thank you all the alums for being here. Phenomenal to hear you, see you and share your experiences post CA. Thank you so much. Will getting tapped to help out with a committee. He had no idea what it was. Appreciate your input and the other students who are involved with us in that. Um, but just in closing, this is, might not be a fair question, but any kind of parting advice, anything that you feel is still out there you'd wanted to say uh, in terms of sharing with current CA students, whether about connecting the dots or just advice in general uh, about next steps. Um, if you would mind doing that uh, uh, before we wrap up, that'd be great. I can start. Um, I think Cary Academy is it's it's a place with all kinds of personalities and whatever bucket you're in. But I think where where when you leave looking for things and people that challenge you is important. I would say a lot of the stuff I care about now I didn't care about when I was at Cary Academy. I was streamlined, focused on getting good grades, impressing my parents, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but just you know, reach seek out people and classes that challenge you. Um, some of the best classes I took in college were weird things like music and medicine or, you know, like things I never would have thought I'd be interested in, but were a whole lot of fun. So um, I think life's a learning process and find things that are fun, but also make you think about things differently. I feel like when thinking about a career, I think we're told that like there's a very specific way you should go about thinking about what career is good for you but I think there are actually like really different ways to think about it about like mm, is being with people what really drives you is a certain type of thinking what really drives you is an issue what really drives you is having enough time to like spend a lot of time with family and friends what really drives you like it um there's so many ways you can think about what you want to get out of your career. Um, so yeah, I think understanding yourself and what really drives you um, is really, really important to that. I can go next. I went to SDLC when I was at Cary Academy, the Student Diversity Leadership Conference 10th grade year. And the phrase of like the whole conference was lean into discomfort. And that has really been what I've strove to do throughout my whole time in college and now post law school is just lean into that discomfort. Even if something is gonna be hard and you don't necessarily think that it's for you, lean into that and see what you can learn from that. I think it's important to do that both in your professional and your personal career. You're gonna be in uncomfortable situations and feel like you don't know everything that you should know about a certain topic, but lean into that, lean into wanting to learn more and asking hard questions. And I think you'll be set. So um, completely agree, um, pushing yourself outside your comfort zone. Um, I'll just, this might be a bit repetitive, but don't lose your curiosity. Take advantage of the opportunities you have for learning and exploration. Um, I majored in history. I had conversations about the revolutions of 1848 and medieval England in two separate job interviews, and I got both of them and helped me create a connection. And I, they were very successful interviews. And um, 
and beyond that, I just it helped me learn how improve my critical thinking and analytical and research skills. Um, be, you know, as a being a history major helped me get my first job at a research organization, and then in turn allowed me to build from there. So um, embrace the curiosity, explore as much as you can. Um, don't worry about specifying yourself too much too early. Oh, fantastic. Great. Thank you all so very much. Students, thank you for taking an hour out of your flex day to join as well. I uh, hope you guys have found it as, uh, I'm sure you found it helpful too. So thanks everyone so much. Um, we will share out the recording and if you want contact info, all these folks have said so, so just to message me or um, uh, Ms. Mulligan, um, I think if you were interested in following up with anyone, I think it's okay if I, we put you on the spot that way, panelist. That's awesome. Okay, great, great. Thank you guys all again very much. And I'm gonna stop recording and students have a really good rest of the afternoon. Bye.